Hello, I'm Leslie Rymore, and today I'm going to look at Roman locks and keys. Keys are common finds, but complete locks, even lock parts, are less common. This can be explained by most locks probably being wooden and thus rarely surviving. However, depictions of boxes and caskets have been found on tombstones. This allows us to make replicas, such as this example, that shows the lock on the front. Keys come in a large variety of types and sizes, as you can see here. Larger keys were more suited for use with securing large storage chests and with locks on large, heavy doors. This door from London shows the keyhole cut in the wood, and the close-up view shows the distinctive L-shaped opening. Smaller objects, smaller keys, were for cupboard doors, boxes and caskets, as this reconstruction of a box from Colchester shows, with the key still in the lock. And keys were also used with shackles and manacles to restrain people. Let's now look at examples of just some of the types of keys used in the Roman period. First is the latch lifter. Perhaps a misnomer, given that keys of this type could lift a latch or they could slide a bolt. The key was manoeuvred through the keyhole to catch onto and raise the latch or tumbler or slide the bolt. Then there is the lift key. Lift keys as a term may also be a misnomer, as they may either have lifted tumblers in the lock or just slid a bolt. The number of teeth suggests they operated a more secure lock than the latch lifter, and the T and L-shaped are the best known. They have between two to four teeth, and the teeth would connect with holes in the tumblers or bolts. The most common type of key is the slide key. It was used with the tumbler lock. These keys have patterns of teeth of various shapes, for example squares, triangles and circles, which correspond with the matching holes in the bolt. Now having engaged the bolt and displaced the tumblers, the key is then used to slide the bolt along horizontally in order to release the door or box lid. And the variety of teeth patterns found show a desire for only the correct key to fit the specific lock. However, some bit patterns could fit more than one bolt pattern and could have opened locks other than those for which the keys were made. And these schematics of actual patterns show that pattern A keys will open locks fitted with A or B pattern bolts, but pattern B keys will only fit pattern B bolts. Now, unsurprisingly, locks and keys have their own terminology. We've encountered two terms, teeth and tumbler, and I want to explore just some of the others. Now, many, but by no means all keys have suspension holes in one end in order, for example, to hang it from a ring or, or, or a hook. This area is called the bow or the loop, and sometimes the hole is only a perforation in the grip or handle, which is the where the key was held to operate it. And it is also possible sometimes to distinguish a stem separating the grip from the bit. The bit may have teeth, as in this example, or ward cuts, as here, depending on the lock technology. And this key has both teeth and ward cuts. Now, ward cuts are designed to negotiate wards that were part of some lock types. A ward is a fixed projection in a lock that prevents a key from entering and or operating the lock unless the ward cuts in the key can negotiate all of the wards. Now, rotary keys, misleading referred to as lever lock keys in many reports, have been used from the Roman period onwards. Rotary keys departed from the lifting and sliding mechanisms of earlier keys. Typically, these keys have hollow-ended stem to fit over a pivot point and a bit with ward cuts which would correspond with the wards concealed within the lock. Now, this form of lock is the basis for many modern locks today. Some forms of keys also appear as finger rings. Termed ring keys, their size denotes that they were secured locks on small items. Indeed, 
Examples have been found on graves, in graves with wooden caskets. Padlocks were perhaps used with a hasp and staple or a chain. Now this padlock key was used in a barb spring padlock, a relatively common form of Roman lock. The design of the mechanism was simple. The key with a ward cut in its bit was pushed down inside the barrel of the padlock, fitting over metal strips or spring barbs on the bolt and squeezing them together, allowing the bolt to be drawn. The padlock case was made from iron, into which the end of the iron bolt with spring barbs was inserted. Once inside, the barbs opened up, securing the bolt. So let's now see how we think the most common type of Roman lock may have worked. When the bolt is in the shot position, that is the lock is engaged, the bolt is held in place by tumblers, each of which fits into its own hole in the bolt. They were sometimes held in place by a spring. To operate the lock, the, ki the teeth of the key must fit in all the holes in the bolt. Inserting the key in the keyhole, aligning the key's teeth with the holes in the underside of the bolt and then lifting the key, the key pushes the tumblers up, freeing the bolt. Once the bolt's free of the tumblers, the key is used to draw the bolt in a sliding action. Now whilst complete locks rarely survive, we do have various lock parts which we need to be able to recognise, mainly lock bolts with cutouts to match the patterns on the slide keys. And copper alloy is by far the most common material for escutcheons, often called lock plates in reports, but some iron ones have been found. Now an escutcheon is a plate to protect the area around the keyhole and may include a keyhole cover or a slot or eye to receive the staple or hasp. The escutcheon was secured on the outside of boxes, chests and doors and was something a metal workers workshop would have made as this relief shows. This drawing shows the remains of the iron escutcheon from a London jewellery box where, as with the Colchester example, the key was found still in the lock. The hasp, which was a hinged plate with a staple, was mounted for example on the lid of a chest or possibly on the escutcheon itself. The staple fitted into the eye in or near the escutcheon and was held in place by the bolt in the lock. When the bolt in the lock was drawn, the staple was released, allowing the hasp to be lifted and the lock opened. The hasp, staple and eye arrangements remain popular today. And we've seen types of keys made in a variety of metals. Iron keys are the most common, followed by copper alloy. And these pie charts of keys from London, Silchester and Roxeter show the preponderance of iron, shown here in red. As some keys are made of a mix of metals, they're composites. That is, keys are both copper alloy, the grip, and iron, the stem and the bit. And some types of key are known only in a single material. For example, barb spring padlock keys are known only in iron. Wood, bone and antler examples of some types are also found, such as this wooden tumbler lock lift key from Vindolanda. And the variety of types of keys show that a number of different types of lock mechanisms were in use, and we tend to put keys into a typology based on WH Manning's types published in the British Museum catalogue, although some caution is needed. Now having looked at a number of the different types, there is a word of warning. It can be challenging, sometimes impossible, to distinguish certain Roman keys from those of later periods. These drawings show a Roman example above with a similar medieval key below. As with other classes of object, on occasions we also find markings scratched onto keys, such as these numerals that were perhaps an aid to identification. The Roman numeral for 35, XXXV, can be seen scratched on the underside of the grip. Decorated keys, even if only a simple moulding, are common. Decoration may simply have been, well, decorative, or it may have had a symbolic value. Such as when one encounters a key such as this with a lion's grip. It's 19.2 centimetres long 
and weighs 1.5 kilograms. Here we may at least suggest that there was a belief that the lion provided additional security over and above the physical protection afforded by the lock and key. And there is also this hairpin with its head in the form of a slide key. Was it a mere fun, fun trinket? A gift from a locksmith to a female loved one? Was the key functional given the object a dual purpose? Was it perhaps a play on words with locks of hair being secured in place? Or the use of a key in this tombstone where clasped hands denote a married couple? A key is one of the manly attributes shown on the husband's side to the right here, linking the key with literacy as shown by the pen, inkwell and book roll. While the wife's string instrument denotes more artistic pursuits, I hope that I have shown that locks and keys can tell us much more than may at first be thought.